Welcome to Applying Industry Experience to Academic Leadership, today's session of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. Today's webinar is offered in valued partnership with Tech United NJ. Previously known as the Tech Council of New Jersey, Tech United NJ empowers innovators, entrepreneurs, and instigators, and we thank them for their support. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Dr. Ralph Gigliotti is the director of the Center for Organizational Leadership at Rutgers University. In addition, he also teaches part-time in several diverse academic disciplines here at the university. Ralph is the author of Crisis Leadership in Higher Education, Theory and Practice, and has co-authored another three books on leadership. Ralph is a national examiner for the Malcolm Baldridge Performance Excellence Program. He also serves as co-chair of the Training and Development Division for the National Communication Association and on the board of directors for the Network for Change and Continuous Innovation. Ralph is collaborating with Executive Education on an exciting new leadership curriculum. Ralph, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and let you take it from here. All right, thank you so much, Morgan. Margaret, it's a pleasure to be here. We move on to the next slide. I'll provide some background regarding this signature leadership series. As you'll see on the slide deck here, the leadership values and principles that um, undergird this webinar series uh, reflect the four R's that are um, really signature to the Rutgers Business School. Resilience, which involves the ability to persevere and work through adversity, resourcefulness, thinking creatively and collaboratively to solve difficult problems, responsibility, which involves exercising ethical judgment and decision-making, and reinvention, having a mindset for lifelong learning. All of the conversations as part of these series reflect these four values and principles and some of the, the questions that uh, we've prepared today to engage in conversation with Chancellor Malloy will tie back to these four R's. So it's my pleasure to be here and a pleasure to moderate this conversation um, with uh, someone who perhaps deserves um, uh, an introduction that's even longer than appears on the slide here, given his background and all that he's done. But Chancellor Malloy, it's a pleasure to have you here. Chancellor Malloy serves as the Chancellor for Rutgers University in New Brunswick, and he has responsibility for advancing the university's mission of excellence in teaching, research, and service. He also holds a faculty position as Distinguished Professor. Dr. Malloy joined Rutgers in 2007 as Dean of the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, and in 2011, he was appointed Interim Provost for Biomedical and Health Sciences. He has held numerous roles at the university, and in February 2019, Dr. Malloy was officially appointed Chancellor of Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Um, I'm really excited today to learn more about some of the connections between the Chancellor's background and industry. As you can see from the bio, he has held senior positions at J&J, Three Dimensional Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, and Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceutical Research Institute and to also learn about the connections between that background and the many challenges that he has been forced to navigate in this moment in time as he leads Rutgers University in New Brunswick. So again, thanks for the invitation to moderate the conversation, Margaret and Chancellor Malloy. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I want to start off with a, a pretty simple question. Um, how are you? This is an extraordinary time and an unusual time. How are you? Uh, that'd be great. Ralph, uh, actually, good afternoon, everyone. And, and, and thanks again for the question. And thanks for the invitation, Margaret and Dean Lay, uh, our fine business school. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to spend this hour with everyone uh, discussing any, any variety of topics we're going we're gonna to get into. Actually, I'm well, thank you. Uh, and the university is managing through what is really an extraordinary year of a, of, a, of, a, of a global pandemic that is it's extremely serious. You know, I have a medical background and, uh, uh, and quite frankly, we're looking at the beginning, hopefully of the end of this with the vaccine, vaccine starting to roll out, albeit somewhat slowly. 
And I think during our conversations in the coming few minutes, we'll talk more about how Rutgers is managing through this. But uh, again, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And, I, and, and I'd like to start by talking a little bit about my journey back to Rutgers, uh, because it didn't just start in 2007. So I don't know whether you had another question ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was really, uh, that's what I think is a great place to start. What, uh, talk, talk to us about the journey behind the official bio and what, what led to the pivot yeah, so, from industry so to higher ed? It's quite it, it's quite amazing to me when I think when I stop and think about it, which I do occasionally, um, because you know I, I and and I, I think there are students on the on the line here as well. You know, I, I never in, in my wildest dreams imagined I would be in a, in positions like this or some of the other ones on my bio screen. You know, I'm a first generation student. I'm the first one in my family uh, to go to college. Um, uh, I grew up in New Jersey. I was born in Brooklyn, grew up in New Jersey. My family is from, from Brooklyn and uh, originally. And uh, although I, I grew up in a town, went to, went to public high schools, it was a very fine, Livingston has a very fine uh, educational um, you know, K through 12 system. Uh, I was always really raised to go to college. Um, um, and Rutgers was the local college that we could afford to go to back in the 70s. And I came to Rutgers at a very interesting time. You know, I'm old enough to, to say that I was my my class, my first freshman class was the first class that integrated women into Rutgers College there before it had been an all men's uh, uh, wow. school and Douglas College was across the across the uh, way with all women and things that obviously have changed a tremendous amount. So, I, you know, I, I graduated. I, I went through pharmacy school. Um, became a licensed pharmacist, worked for a couple of years actually, not really knowing that I had an interest in going to graduate school or, or a, a more advanced degree. But, but you know, what in that grow up period that, that some men go through until their early 20s, um, I realized that, you know, I really hadn't, hadn't really, um, can, you know, used my, my skill set to the best of my ability. So I really challenged myself by going to graduate school my PhD is in pharmacology and toxicology, really a cancer research project that, that I did. Went on to postdoctoral studies at the National Cancer Institute, you know, really thought I would be in academia and then wound up really, you know, at the time. And, and again, this is a lesson for students. You know, what is what are the opportunities at the time in your career where you're faced with making some decisions? And really, the for me, my my opportunities were in the in the pharmaceutical industry, which was really starting to really undergo a lot of basic research initiatives that leveraged to my background in in academic my academic background at the National Cancer Institute. That's changed quite a bit, and and, and we can get into how business has evolved in a, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in industry, you know, in various positions as a scientist, as a as a, a leader of a group leader. I jumped to a biotech company, which was the which was the the mode back in the '80s. Still is somewhat relevant today. All these startup companies happened. The company grew. We had an IPO, and then um, after 9/11 bubble happened, um, one of our uh, collaborating large companies, Johnson and Johnson, acquired the company. And I never applied to Johnson and Johnson, but I wound up having a pretty senior research position there. Um, again using a lot of the R's that you talk about. This is the way that, you know, some things, things seem to eventuate, you know, and, uh, and then I stayed in touch with Rutgers all this time. I would give occasional lectures to this pharmacy school and in the um, early 2000s, the faculty there asked me to apply to be the Dean of the school that I got my undergraduate degree from. Um, and luckily, the, the, the executive vice president at the time, and this is again, you know, a networking coincidence, was a cancer research scientist, Dr. Phil Fermansky, mm -hmm. and he could certainly recognize my CV, had the qualifications to be an academic dean, and uh, I, was, I was thrust back to Rutgers. That's where the fun started. Huh. Okay, so, so you may want to, I, I, I want to give you a chance to say something here, but th this is where I noticed a huge difference between industry and academia. Yeah. Um, okay. So real quick, when you, um, what was it like in, in those first couple of days as dean to be dean of the school where you graduated? Well, you know, it was, uh, it, 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 well, it took a couple months before I, when I negotiated getting away from um, you know, leaving J and J and giving them notice, and quite frankly, I wasn't sure I wanted to take the position. You know, I had a pretty good job at you know, pretty senior position at J and J, and I was asking my colleagues in, in industry, 
you know, what do you think? Do you think I should do this? And, and they were like, are you crazy? You have to do this. <laughs> this is a real life, once in a lifetime opportunity because it's a very yeah. non-traditional way to jump into academia. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, um, it, I, knew that, I knew many of the faculty already. And in, in, interestingly, the, the, the dean who I was replacing, John Calese, who's a wonderful person and still on the faculty at the School of Pharmacy, he signed my PhD thesis you know, wow. 30 years earlier, right, wow. or 20, 25 years earlier. And many of the other faculty members were friends, people that I had known as a student. So, uh, so becoming their dean was quite interesting. Although, you know, obviously a lot of time had passed and, and lots of, uh, you know, maturing had certainly happened. Um, sure. Uh, but, you know, the things that were very interesting to me were the differences, okay? And, mm -hmm. and, and my industry background was very helpful. So the industry is a team sport, okay? And many of the, um, many of the, uh, successes one has in industry is really working with a team, recognizing the value of individual team members, giving credit to others, um, you know, taking risks, but understanding where you, where there are go, no go decisions on certain scientific projects, for example, or investments. It's a very different uh, mentality when one gets into an academic enterprise where we really, although we, we certainly, we value those three things of, educational education research and service it's really about individual professors and how they advance their careers it's all about them it's all about how they prove themselves individually versus working in a team and so you're dealing the herding cats mentality or the herding cats analogy i should say yeah. you know comes to mind uh and that's not not in a bad way these are very talented individual faculty members that we have in various schools, but you know they are certainly focused on their own research, their careers, and and quite frankly, they they can be very good uh, educators. Um, but getting them getting them to be aligned on a vision for a school or for initiative, getting them to participate in in multidisciplinary research, which is sometimes very important, is not always so easy. Um, the other thing is about time frames. Okay, so the biggest adjustment I had to make. Uh, was how slow things are in academia. And that's not a bad thing necessarily either. It, it, you know, academia, you have time to think, plan, consult, you know, uh, whereas in industry, especially the pharmaceutical industry uh, nowadays, and, and you can see it ba based upon the progress we've made in vaccinations this year, is a really time sensitive, go, go, go environment. Decisions are made quickly. Um, there's a, a story that I tell often when I came and talked to Dean Calasi about important things that had to happen in the School of Pharmacy during my early tenure. He said, he said, Chris, things are it's very, very, very critical, urgent. He used the word urgent that you do these three things. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's urgent. You certainly have to do them in the next two years. Mm -hmm. And for me, urgent and two years. <laughs> Coming from, Johnson, a, a, coming from Johnson and Johnson, urgent is two weeks, maybe a, a week time horizon, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so th that just was a um, an example of really the differences here. So th it's the the timing, the, the teamwork, the, the emphasis on coaching, and and really professional leadership development. Ralph, you're you're sort of an expert in this area. This is something that is highly valued by by large by industries large and small. And we need to do a better job at academia in that space. And, and, and you and I are going to talk about that offline in many, many ways. Oh, and of course, understanding how we can do multidisciplinary big things at Rutgers, you know, and that's something that the new president and I and, and others are talking about how, how we can make that happen in, in our current budgeting system. That sounds great. And it sort of ties in nicely with the, the next question that, I, that I've been wondering, you know, there, there is no shortage of challenges facing industry and facing higher education in this current moment. Um, even just to sort of wrap our minds around the many converging and um, interconnected issues facing our society is quite an undertaking. Um, what, as chancellor, what are one, two, three things that really keep you up at night? The kinds of leadership challenges that you think are, um, are most crucial to the work of the academy at this moment? Yeah, uh, a good question. And, and um, 
perhaps a, a, a more complex answer. So, so Rutgers is a bit unique in, in Rutgers is unique in many ways, uh, mm -hmm. being certainly a, a very fine and very large university. Complicated, you can see it even in the business school where it's, it's part of New Brunswick and Newark with, with multiple chancellors. And, and as the audience may know, most of the audience probably knows, Rutgers since 2013 is, has brought in the former University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey as part of, as our new Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences Division. And the, it's, it's led by a chancellor. I'm the chancellor of, of the New Brunswick campus, the main undergrad, grad, you know, classic uh, flagship campus. Dr. Cantor is the chancellor of the Newark campus where the business school is largely based also. And the, there's a chancellor in Camden and we have one president. So in many ways, we're a very complicated organization. Since that six year, um, since that, uh, that merger six or seven years ago, um, and so uh, the, there's challenge. There's a, been a lot of change. So so the the, the 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 university has been buffeted by changes in structure, by ch with this lar with this unique merger that we had the largest merger in U.S. history actually in higher education. Um, the faculty have been buffered by changes in the way we do our budgeting. This the new RCM budget models that the university has that's changed the way that schools operate in many ways, allowing them to be entrepreneurial. But there's still we're still working through some of the transparency about how costs are, are shared among the different schools and, and, and chancellor units and, and the central administration. We're challenged by a new president who's really done a fine and fantastic job in his few months here it, it, taking over during a pandemic. And I, I can't say enough good things about President Holloway uh, and, and his um, and his leadership so far. Uh, and really certainly now challenged by this pandemic, actually, that is just, uh, that is just, a, you know, once in a lifetime, hopefully, um, thing, but of course it's affecting all of higher education. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, the, the main challenge is to basically in a buffeted by all this change buffeted by the pandemic, you know, how can we, um, focus on the, the key things that need to happen at a university from an education perspective from a um, resource perspective in terms of managing faculty and, and, and hiring and, and, and operating the university with a lot of fixed costs. Um, and how do we um, plan for the future where we have some immediate changes happening? For example, Rutgers normally has many out of state and international students that are now highly disadvantaged or, or blocked from coming to the university in the next year or two. And they're a source of significant revenue for us because they pay international, you know, out-of-state rates um, that help to us to offset and, and keep very low any, any tuition increases we have for New Jersey students. And so these demographic changes that are acute, and then in five years, there's a demog demographic cliff coming where there's just a lot less, excuse me, high school students available to the university. Um, make it very make a very challenging environment for us. I have to compliment the faculty, staff, and students of the university and how they've been able to pivot to this remote environment mm -hmm. and really make it work. Mm -hmm. It's not fun for any of us, but I actually have seen many um, uh, uh, surveys by students that although they don't like it and they don't like not being together on campus and face-to-face, -face, they're able to be successful yeah. For the large part, and able to be able to move forward. So um, I'll tell talk more about oh. the pandemic response in in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate that that response so much because it highlights um, so many so many degrees of complexity that someone in your position needs to be mindful of. The many stakeholders who have interests in the work of the university, and the many environmental and institutional challenges that weigh on the mind of someone in, in a role such as yours. So we have a pretty diverse audience here with folks from academia, industry, and, and friends of the university. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about in the center as a leader is to be goal-centered, to have a pretty clear sense of how you're pursuing a leadership endeavor and what are the ways in which you're going to measure success. In the context of that ambiguous and complex environment that we're in now, how do you as a leader set goals, set priorities,
set a vision while also remaining flexible to circumstances that lie beyond our control. Yeah, um, the $64,000 question as they used to say, right? <laughs> Back in the day, and that's not much money anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you know, uh, and that's another difference with industry, actually. In, mm -hmm. Industry typically has very, you know, um, succinct goals. Uh, you know, goal, I know J&J &J has, has a very sophisticated system of doing, uh, rolling out goals from the top down to different divisions. And one can, one can put in their own, their divisional goals and, and, uh, and, and see where they fit into the matrix, actually, of, of the, of the um, corporation. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, it, the university has been moving in that direction using a Salesforce tool. Uh, and, and I think it is a worthwhile endeavor, although it's not, some, it's not just a paper or electronic exercise. It's something that the, the leaders, leaders require, to, they need, need to have a really good team, uh, be, a, be a cheerleader for the team, and to, and to try to communicate clearly about you know where there are where there can be variances in what we're trying to do based upon circumstances. So, President Holloway, for example, in this case, he set out three large goals for the university coming in, right, to create a beloved community, which is, it sounds somewhat nebulous, but I think we all kind of understand it's 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 to be able to, you know, we're at a university, <clears throat> we're doing, we're doing important work for education, research, and service to to the world. Um, you know, we you know we want the citizens and our alumni to recognize this and 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 help us build a community that tolerates differences, can have debates, and but but is you know but civically minded and uh, and it really is a is a place for young people and 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 old folks to to grow, learn, and together in, in a nice in a, in an important communicative way. Also, to become academically excellent. Okay, and of course we're challenged with resources right now, but what what does academic excellence means and the translation has to happen through through me and through my dean leadership teams and then of course to to sort of inst look at Rutgers very complicated you know uh, institutional um, uh, structure right now and simplify it in a way for for alumni for the state for our citizens to understand for our students to understand so that you know we can make progress as a single, as the single large state university of New Jersey uh, that Rutgers really is, so much larger than the other universities with more research expenditures a year, every year than all the other universities in New Jersey put together, including Princeton. If you add mm -hmm. them all together, it's smaller than what Rutgers does. And people don't appreciate the scope of this as our university has evolved so much in the last 10, 20 years. All right, so we, there is a goal setting process. Um, I do hold the deans that report to me and my cabinet that reports to me accountable to goals. Some of them are metrics about fundraising for, um, you know, for just for general um, uh, philanthropy. Some of them are about um, budgetary aspects to their to their school. Some of them are about creating support for these new diversity and equity initiatives that are so important and, and being highlighted by President Holloway in this beloved community in, environment. Yes, yeah. Um, and we have constant feedback, you know, you know, discussions about this. It isn't like I, we, I throw some paper over the wall to them and come back in six months. We meet on a regular basis uh, and I'm basically their cheerleader mm -hmm. and, their, and the problem solver. But, but again, I've, the important thing any leader has to do is have a good team, identify those that you can work with and let them do their work and, and not micromanage them. Well, it, so it, that balance it, is really important. And it seems somewhat inspired from your industry background, going back to where you started the conversation, that team collaborative, interdisciplinary, agile approach to problem solving is something that maybe informs how you kind of approach it in this academic context. Yeah, and, and, and like anyone, and, and, I, and this is for, the, for students, you know, you know, I recognize certain traits in, in leaders that I, I encountered in my industry career, and even, even in my academic career, um, who I really thought embodied, you know, you know in, that inspired people. You didn't have to necessarily love the person, but, sure. you know, inspired them to really function, you know, and, and see how teamwork worked. Uh, the best leaders are the ones that give credit to everybody else. Yeah. And, and not take it to themselves. And this is, this is actually, this is a subtle thing, but it, you know, it's a challenge for 
really successful academics who have grown up all about them. And, that, and again, I'm not, that's not a bad thing to say, right? You know, who right. have developed their career and become just, you become a distinguished professor by publishing lots of papers, being recognized by individually for your accomplishments, you know, and having, and them all of a sudden trying to manage teams. There's a, there's a tension there that's not everyone can, can actually be successful doing that. Mm. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, perhaps I'm not as an accomplished an academic as, and, and I know that I'm not as many of the faculty even at Rutgers, but um, there are aspects about team leadership that I that I apparently am good at because I I keep getting these these jobs. You keep getting these. That I don't I, that I don't apply for. <laughs> so to, to, to use the word you used earlier, those uh, windows of opportunities that you're able to detect in the in the environment, right? Yeah, but but I. I to be honest, I, you know, I haven't applied for many of them. I mean, it's just sort of, sort of happens, you know, huh. I mean, I did apply to be the Dean, but you know, I had to, you know, earn that, earn the position when I, when, during, the, during the application process. Um, I see some questions coming in from the audience. Feel free to contribute those and I'll, we'll make sense of those and I'll share them back to, to the chancellor. Um, one of the questions that I had here um, ref, ref, relates back to one of the uh, business school principles of, of reinvention. There is so much discussion right now regarding the reinvention of higher education writ large. Some folks are, are terrified by the idea of reinvention. Um, some are really enthusiastic and excited about what reinvention of higher education might look like. What, what's your reaction to the question and what are some of the changes that you anticipate we as an institution might have to attend to um, as we reinvent for uh, a, a world that might look quite different than it did prior to the pandemic? Yeah, um, good question and, and an interesting way to think about the, the question, Ralph. Um, you, you know, first, first of all, my reaction is, you know, if I, I embrace change because Things would be boring otherwise. You know, I mean, right. you know, people. I tend to get bored. Do we get bored by just doing the same old thing? Uh, that's kind of why I like basic research initially. And I and I one thing I do miss is being a basic research scientist, or even I, I still keep a toe into this with some of the research initiatives certainly going on with COVID. I'm I'm on an email trail with lots of the docs and in, in the university and scientists, you know, that are that are dealing with COVID. Um, but you know, research is always changing and evolving quickly. So that's it's, it's something the the change, embracing change is is what I mean by that. Clearly, the pandemic and the pivoting have for, and and the impact on our financial picture have forced are forcing changes on higher education. There's a silver lining a little bit in this, though. Actually, one of the things that we I, we recognized at Rutgers even a decade ago was the fact that we really were not good at online education. We weren't getting our act together. We weren't thinking about how there are new ways to deliver uh, educational content to not just your typical students coming out of high school, but you know, professionals in industry, um, non-traditional students that have actually worked for a while and wanna come back and change their careers. Uh, our university wasn't very flexible, perhaps isn't still not flexible enough to, to be able to allow these things to happen. And I, I give Dean Lay a lot of credit. They've done a lot of very positive things in the business school in this regard. And there's terrific programs, executive MBA programs, et cetera, that, that are, have been advanced. But in general, across the university, we haven't been good. I'll tell you what, the pandemic has forced us to be very good at online education and developing capabilities both on campus and remotely to do, deliver synchronous, asynchronous content, to have interactions with students using technologies um, to allow us to develop courses that we wouldn't normally be thinking about. And I think it will lead us to be able to expand our offerings to a greater population of, of students um, and, and, and citizens in, in much more interesting ways in the future. And, and I think you know, we, it won't be any going back to the mostly face-to-face, -face, although I can't wait. And, and I fully expect the fall given the rollout of vaccinations to be much more normal, but not completely normal than certainly it is right now. So, you know, I think we're, we're going to see a lot of change in, in delivery of, uh, and pedagogy around uh, using technologies better. And it's gonna change the way we interact 
you know, at all levels of the university in terms of going to meetings. Yeah. Uh, do we really have to tr everybody travel to New Orleans for this meeting? Yeah. You know, there, there's ways we can shift resources around. Yeah. Um, there's ways we can, you know, leverage more technology to do many more things. Um, and so I'm very excited about that, actually. Um, and, you know, uh, trying to develop these, this, this online presence, um, you know, uh, will allow us to really have more touch points, even internationally with education. And I'm, I look forward to that. Um, thank you so much. I, I think it paints a really optimistic picture of where the university might move towards in ways that draw upon what we've learned from the last year or so, and in ways that, that do reinforce and tie back to our distinctive mission as an institution as well. And, and we've been able to, you know, do a lot of interesting things. So, so for example, one of, one of the real um, uh, roadblocks to us, and I know Dean Lay in the business school, this is an important aspect to them. We have many student, international students that want to come to Rutgers, want to come to the business school, want to come to the university. Um, many of our Big Ten colleagues or uh, univer peer universities are like this as well. Uh, we've been able to um, create relationships in, the la in this year with several universities in China, for example, to allow students that have been accepted to Rutgers that can't get here to have an option to live on these on, on one of three campuses in China, um, to live to leave home and live on a Chinese campus that that has an association with us, hmm. and we're providing education either remotely or through local um, lecturers that we identify at the university. So there's Rutgers cohorts being managed, you know, overseas that we hopefully will be able to bring to Rutgers next year or. In, in, in subsequent years. And this kind of a, of a sharing program, not just with China, but with other countries around the world could be a very important way that we can engage a global community in our educational uh, offerings. And, and that kind of global, you know, uh, globalization of education is really very valuable for our New Jersey students that come here, especially, sure. you know, first generation students. We still have 30% of our students are first generation at, at the university. Wow. Um, you know, access is extremely important at the university, and, and I'm very excited about how that might happen in a much bigger way, too. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chancellor. Uh, I'm, I'm reading through some of the questions from the audience here, and there are a couple that, um, that sort of reflect a similar theme that, that I want to pose to you. Uh, thinking beyond the pandemic, um, What's, what's been sort of a defining leadership moment for you, a defining or central leadership challenge that you've experienced over your career? Um, how, how did you respond to it and, and what did, did you learn from it? Okay, well, I can, there's, it's an easy answer for me, okay? <laughs> Uh, and this is this is one of the questions we didn't rehearse ahead of time, actually, which right. is exciting, but it's maybe the easiest one. So I was here as dean from 2007 and in, in, in 2011, when President Richard McCormick was the president of Rutgers, uh, I got a call as the pharmacy dean to come to his office the next day. I didn't know what that was just about. And basically he said to me, Chris, um, the medical schools are going to merge. The medical UMD and J is going to merge into Rutgers, and he wanted me to lead the Rutgers side of the merger. Okay, so I didn't, you know, things were things were as a dean were going were slow. It was a really nice job to be a dean, and all of a sudden I was back quote in industry mode like overnight. Uh -huh. I didn't sleep a lot that night because because we're talking again about the biggest merge, the largest merger in higher education history. Okay, so this is really, this is where it got really interesting. So, you know, we, we decided, we, we went through a lot of exercises. This is before President Barchi was even here. We identified Price Waterhouse Coopers as our, as our uh, merging partner. We had 30 or 40 Price Waterhouse people to send on Rutgers and start setting up these integration teams. We had a legislative deadline of July 1st, 2013, and basically had a Gantt chart backward from there to get this all done, I mean, to get, you know, payrolls all paid ju ju July 1st in a new system, the former University of Medicine and Dentistry was gonna go away. And I was in charge of managing the integration process, 
with D, with all the deans and, and administrators from a, the, the University of Medicine and Dentistry, which were not part of Rutgers and did not report to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a major job to, to get everyone to sort of think okay, to pay attention to, to, to have both sides listen to each other. This was not a takeover. This was a merger of quote unquote equals. All of the things I learned in industry for 20 years beforehand, you know, all of those little, uh, those little ways to sort of, you know, um, make people feel valued, listen to, and uh, were, were, were used to the, to the nth degree. And of course I had tremendous help from, from administrators and, and, and project managers that I, I, to this day, you know, I'm grateful for. But it was, a, it was a huge, and I was dealing with Governor Christie and his staff on the phone. And sure. so it was quite an exciting time and it was quite a challenge for my, um, my leadership um, experiences. And, um, but it all obviously yeah. it's kind of all worked out. Well, I mean, and you must be know. just so proud to see sort of the prominence of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences now in the relationship with RBHS in New Brunswick. It must be a real great source of pride for you. It, it is. And actually, I was, the, I was the first chancellor for that, very interim. And I wasn't planning to be the chancellor there. But uh, I was, a, I was um, the head of the search committee for Dr. Strom, who is a close friend now. I didn't know him before. And, uh, and actually that's the important, and it still carries forwards because the New Brunswick campus and, the, and RBHS together are form the AAU campus, the main campus of Rutgers um, in terms of research. Uh, and that was, the, that was the idea behind the merger to strengthen Rutgers by adding this biomedical you know, university, even though it was a stressed one at the time financially. But it's really turned itself around, and our relationships now are with the, with the hospital system, the Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System. So again, that that really was a challenge. It it, it was uh, it was a, a lot of work for almost two years, um, but it was very gratifying, and um, and uh, and it's you know, I, it, and as I say, it was actually my pleasure to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. So, Thank you for sharing that and for unpacking some of what was going on in your own sense making as you were navigating a challenge of that of that kind. Um, there are a few questions here, Chancellor, about um, alternative credentials and sort of the workforce of the future. What, what are some of your thoughts about the new degree model of flexible hybrid degrees or alternative credentials? that are perhaps more relevant to the requirements of the workforce of the future, particularly as it relates to emerging technologies and other, other areas? So, so that's an excellent question. And you know, I'm very um, open-minded about this, actually. Um, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, before COVID, thinking about really the initiatives at the university that I was interested in tackling, a main one is, you know, there's lots of questions about the relevance of a college education, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it's some of us say, well, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, the traditional degrees where you're doing these certain courses to get a major in X, you know, how relevant is that ultimately to, your, to, to what you need to do in the job market? And so clearly the evolution in the business school has done a very nice job of this, thinking about the evolution of some of the pathways to, um, to industry positions um, uh, is really very important to think about constantly. Uh, you know, I'm very focused, I've been very focused on experiential learning. So I would like students at the university from the undergrad level uh, right on through to think about ways that they, to be able to provide ways for them to interact with companies, to think about how internships and co-ops and other things can happen to get them some real world experience while they're undergraduates, even starting early on where they think about potentially big ideas in the world that interest them and how they might be able to move their, their, their majors or their, their education towards understanding how to solve these things. And obviously solving them sometimes requires a team approach. And so we are experimenting with a few different programs in New Brunswick where, where students are in, a, are in this, um, this entrepreneurship pathway to really think about how they can can get can get sort of educated, not not necessarily formally cred credentialed. Although I'm I'm open to thinking about new d degree majors that 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 are that are more leveraged to giving uh, someone 
um, experiential learning that, that's relevant to industry. And I'm very interested in talking to alumni and to industry leaders about what skill sets and what things they, they need, our students need to have um, and, and evolving the curriculum in multidisciplinary ways to address this. A clear, a clear one is in data science. You know, we're looking to really um, build out much larger initiative in, in computer science, data science, and, and, the, and the interactions it is in communications in the business school in the biomedical areas, and even in even in the humanities, you know, mm -hmm. putting this all together in, in multidisciplinary ways, because this is really where a lot of the job growth job markets need to be. And quite frankly, alternative credentialing that might be for non-traditional students would be something that we could we could take advantage of here too. But Absolutely. I clearly clearly the the, the uh, higher ed needs to evolve in this in this way and, and be relevant has to stay relevant to. Um, to the mission of, of really creating uh, citizens that are able to take on the jobs of the 21st century. Uh, thank you for that. Great, thoughtful answer, really. Um, uh, there are other questions here, Chancellor, and um, I wanna go back to something you said earlier about by having um, a, a strong international presence on the New Brunswick campus, it really serves to the advantage of our New Jersey residents, our New Jersey students, when you can engage in um, diverse conversations around a, a wide range of issues. One of the questions here is about the merits of having individuals from diverse cultures contributing, the question's about contributing to industry, but I think we could broaden it, sort of what in your opinion is sort of the, 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 the asset of diversity and internationalization on the university campus or in collaborative team endeavors from industry or in higher ed? A, a couple of aspects to this, and, and I'm not sure where the questioner is coming from exactly. So first of all, um, Rutgers is the State University of New Jersey. And, and typically we have you know, 75 to 80% of our students come from New Jersey and we're not looking to change that mission, okay? Um, that said, uh, so, so I want that to be clear. Okay, in other words, we're not trying to shift to a private type, you know, institution mm -hmm. where we have predominantly. We're not serving the citizens of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, from a business perspective, the differential intuition that one gets from out-of-state students, domestic out-of-state students from California, or Pennsylvania, and international students does help our revenue stream offset costs and, and can invest in some of the financial resources that we can provide our New Jersey students who need access to the university. Mm -hmm. And having the right balance of that is important. But now getting culture, getting educationally, getting to the point about a global culture. You know, I've worked in global companies, Bristol Myers Squibb, Johnson & Johnson, and in any industry, any significant industry in the United States, especially based in New Jersey, there's a huge global component to understanding cultures, understanding uh, questions that uh, other, other countries have about, about uh, you know, how business, pra business practices around the world. And this kind of, you know, points of view of, of, of you know, climate change and, and a variety of other aspects, you know, politics, this is all a valuable learning exercise for any, any citizen, any college student uh, in any, any context. And so, Having that kind of mixture um, is, is really very valuable. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily importing out international students to take American jobs. I mean, I know that there's some concern about that. Many, most, most international students are leave, go, go back to their countries and export some of the education that they got in the United States. Um, but I really do think it's valuable and I think it's, um, it's it's critical actually in the 21st century to have this this international uh, understanding of, of of the world um, certainly than 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 just a, a domestic perspective. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Malloy. Um, I promise you, I didn't script this question, but someone mentioned it in the chat and also in the Q and A about um, how do we? So our center focuses on leadership development. What what are your recommendations for webinar participants who are interested in developing their own leadership competencies? Um, books, podcasts, articles was the question, but more broadly, do you have any suggestions for students, alumni, staff, or faculty that are looking to, to deepen their understanding of leadership and become more proficient and, and, and effective in their leadership endeavors? 
Um, you know, Ralph, uh, you can, you can, you're a better answer to part of this than me, I think, and you're with your experience. Okay. There are certain, um, there are certain, um, online tools that one can, you can point them to, um, uh, there are, you know, I've been through some of these 360 evaluations um, mm -hmm. more formally when, you know, which is not something that you can easily do, but you can, you can understand your own personality using some of the online tools that actually is helpful. I mean, you should mm -hmm. be open and be to be a, to objectivity. Um, actually, I, what I found in my life, actually, is I took some courses in, in psychology and, and personality when I was a student that mm -hmm. were very helpful in helping me think about the world and 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 me, me indiv and what kind of what kind of person I was, I think you know, um, and and everyone's a little different. Sure. That's one thing. The other thing is really is a, is to find a mentor or find mm -hmm. find an individual that you think um, that 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 you think is a good leader and and try to have that have a meeting with them. You know, try to. You know, now this is not so easy to do if you want to meet with, you know, uh, with, you know I can't have 100 student meetings, you know, but, 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 you know, we, we could, and again, Ralph, you're in this leadership uh, group in, at Rutgers, yeah. you know, finding ways, finding faculty or alumni um, uh, who want to give back and actually meet some students, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a way to sort of get, get some training that's some insights that is that wouldn't be difficult to do i know there was one thing in pharmacy that we used to do when i was a dean we had this quote unquote speed dating kind of evening mm. where students were invited and alumni were invited okay alumni successful alumni and they would we you know like you know maybe 10 20 30 of them and then there we'd spend like there'd be like a three minute period where the student and alumni would sit and talk one on one and then move on to the next person mm. you know and and it was a way for a student to get some ask some questions some questions or get some insights about different people who are been successful presumably in the field um, what a great opportunity for learning that would be yeah and it, it yeah. was fun it was actually fun it was fun for both sides mm. And it was fun for the alums to give back, hmm. and um, that's another way. But but I do think, I do think I, that yeah, I think those are great strategies. They're accessible for so many of the audience members, and and very tangible as well. And I I can't help but think too, just from listening to you um, in this conversation, how important. And we talk a lot about this in the center and in our various programs. The importance of re reflective practice is as a leadership strategy. So as you're engaged in leadership endeavors, and when I know we have a diverse audience here, so leadership is going to mean something different to each of us, but to go through some of the sense making that, that you're doing here, um, an honest understanding and articulation of where our challenges are, what our goals are, and when charged with, whether it be small challenges or large wide scale integrations, such as the kind that you've led, um, how can I pursue those goals in a systematic manner? And how can I learn from the successes and from the failures? Right. Right. And, 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 and when things, you know, when things go to heck, which they, right. which they sort of had this year, <laughs> what, you, what you have to do is just take a deep breath, sure. step back, you know, not panic yes. and, and, and prioritize what you have to do first. Like in other yes. words, if there's you know 25 things wrong just prioritize and start working on the top three to four you know and um yeah you know you, you know um and you have to be also open to you know criticism open to be objective about yourself and your strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. um and they and you can work on them and many of the tools ralph that you're more familiar with than i am with respect to you know leadership development those are really helpful actually to understand yeah. what kind of a you know what quadrant you are in as a leader. I'm I'm alluding to some of those uh, yes those online tools and things like that. It's yeah. really it is really helpful. Thank you so much for the response, Dr. Malloy. Um, there are a few questions in the Q and A here regarding um, uh, tying back to this idea of virtual teaching and the experience of remote teaching over the last year at Rutgers and and what impact you think it's had on the quality of education 
and expectations for both faculty and students. Um, you suggested earlier that it's been a great learning opportunity for the university and that we've all gotten better and more comfortable with some of the online education. Um, what additional thoughts do you have regarding sort of the shift to almost fully virtual teaching and the quality of pedagogy and education? So, you know, so it's not, it's not optimal in many cases, okay? Because I just think, I just think, you know, from, as, a, as a human, the face-to-face in, mm -hmm. -face interactions and the ability to walk up to a professor after class, you know, is really a very important part of, of this. And plus learning from your, your fellow students, you know, by asking them questions. Um, so on the other hand, um, it provides more flexibility. It gives, uh, depending, and, and there are um, some faculty that have really been able to develop the technologies to a point where, and, and to use them to interact with students, even on, you know, in, in office time, quote unquote, to, to really allow it to be, you know, quite, quite usable, especially for students that might be working um, and have other distractions uh, than, than the full-time students that we typically have as under, or many of, many of us have as undergrads here. So, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's been perfect. I mean, you know, obviously it's been, um, we've managed, we've, yeah. we've, most students have not fallen far behind. I can't say perhaps that might not be the case in K through 12 situations. That, sure. that is really a very difficult situation, I think, for m in many cases. Mm -hmm. But in terms of our college students, you know, I think that they've been able to mostly stay on track uh, and, and, we, and we've tried to provide as much flexibility as we can. But, but I do think that it's, it's forced everyone to see what the op possibilities might be for remote uh, learning. And, and it will help, jump us, help us jumpstart some of the new ways that we can do this for other, to engage more students and more um, citizens in, in what the university is doing uh, than just the people that are on campus. That's outstanding. And I'm sure uh, answers nicely some of the questions that, that folks have here regarding that. Um, we have about five minutes left and I don't want to lose time and not ask you this question because I think it's a great question um, to, to end on. What do you ask of us as faculty, staff, students, alumni and friends of the university to help Rutgers achieve excellence in all regard? Wow. I think it's such a um, thoughtful, it's a great question, isn't it? It's a, yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, it, the main thing I would ask is to stay engaged and not just um, read what is written in certain press newspapers, because this is a, this is a huge university with which generates a, a, a tremendous amount of ideas and innovation and um, and research in a in a whole wide variety of areas. And we're not just um, we're not just the football coach that did something wrong. Although our new coach has not done anything wrong as far as I know mm -hmm. yet. Right? We're not just um, you know, we're not just a, a university that has uh, financial issues due to COVID, which we certainly do actually very significantly have. And I didn't really want to get into that, but we'll, we'll get through that. You know, we're, we're, a, we're a, play, a, you know, the university wants to be a positive place for, the, for New Jersey, wants to be, you know, you know wants to advance knowledge and um, solutions for citizens that we do in our land grant mission with our cooperative extension in all the different counties with all the health care that we provide through all the patients in new jersey so there's a big story here and and, and i would ask you know um, everyone to sort of look at look at what we put out in terms of that big story and actually carry the message to others about it all right M people that you work with people that you, um, that might be interested in the university, um, professionals in industry that might look at Rutgers and see what we have to offer in a lot of areas. Um, you know, to, to, uh, to take, a, take a broad view of Rutgers, you know, and, and help us go where we wanna go, because we're just, don't, we don't wanna be static. We wanna move and educate and advance um, knowledge in ways that um, 
that are completely relevant to the economic development of the state of New Jersey, of the United States of America, and, and really develop citizens that are really well balanced and civically minded. Um, and un unfortunately, we're seeing all too much of citizens that are that are not that way in the last uh, in the last few years and in the last couple of days. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a, it's an important message to end on, Chancellor, and a great charge for all of us who had the pleasure of listening to you today. Um, there's an exciting story to be told about Rutgers and an exciting story to be told about Rutgers, New Brunswick. And we, uh, we wish you continued success as Chancellor and look forward to whatever that reinvention might look like as we return to some degree of normalcy. We look forward to learning together through that. We're getting there, Ralph. All right. Thanks very much. And it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Chancellor Malloy. Yeah, yes. thank you, uh, Ralph and Chancellor Malloy, both of you so much for your time. Um, I think today's conversation was extremely relevant, um, you know, challenging and changing times in uh, both industry and academia are, you know, before us. So it was very informative to hear about uh about your leadership journey. Many things that I didn't know about you, Chancellor Malloy, even though you're my, uh, let's see, big, big, big boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd like to also thank our audience who certainly enhanced the discussion with their enthusiastic participation in Q&A and chat. Um, and I wanted to leave on a, a couple of notes, a friendly reminder that the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series takes place on Thursdays at noon Eastern for 2021, we'll be trying to stick with the second Thursdays. For more information, you can always visit our webpage. I know it's long, so those who we have an email address for, you'll receive this via email, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Next up, we're welcoming Matt Kane, Global Head of Johnson & Johnson's Enterprise Center for Leadership, Learning, and Innovation. We always have an exciting schedule of topics and presenters lined up um, several months in advance, but they're all thanks to great suggestions from our audience, so we encourage you to keep sharing your ideas with us. We want the series to continue to meet your needs. Please stay online for just a moment longer, everyone, as today's webinar ends. You'll immediately see a very brief survey about today's event, one of which is a free-form field to type in topics and or speakers you'd like to see featured in our future webinars. And finally, as I mentioned when our webinar began earlier, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to those who registered. It will also appear on the Business Insights page of our website. I'd like to give one last uh, thanks to everyone involved um, and wish everyone a great day. Take care, all. <laughs>